Hey everybody, I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with another reaction for you all today and I've done several videos on uh, Irish slavery and uh, the Irish uh, potato farming and stuff and I wanted to go in in depth into it to see what the, uh, the potato farming was all about. So today I'll be reacting to a timeline of the potato farming that changed Ireland forever. So let's go ahead on YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what uh, what this uh, uh, potato farming was all about. In 1845, Ireland's potato crop was devastated by an unknown disease. The resulting food shortage would spiral into a human rights disaster that lasted years and took the lives of over one million people. Fearing their homeland would never recover from what was being called the Great Hunger, millions of Irish immigrants fled to the United States. It forever changed both countries and the whole world. Today we're going to lay out a timeline of the potato famine that changed Ireland forever. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. Oh, and if it's not too much to ask, once you've done that, leave a comment and let us know what topics you would like to hear about. Okay, so let's see how it all went down. Although okay. the two are frequently associated, potatoes are not native to Ireland. And you might be surprised to learn that it wasn't until 1589 that Sir Walter Raleigh introduced the potato to the Irish. It was Okay, now, hearing that, that's kind of interesting there. We learned a lot about Sir Walter Raleigh back in school back home uh, on the island. He was a prominent figure in the historical events and stuff uh, for the islands. Now, growing up on the island, we used to call it Irish potatoes. And living on a small island like that, you're kind of isolated, so you don't know about the different uh, strains of it or anything like that. So I remember when I first came to America and I was told to go to the store to get some, some potatoes, I went and I brought back sweet potatoes, you know what I mean? I, I didn't think of it, you know what I mean? And then um, I was told, no, 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 that's not the potatoes. I want Idaho potatoes, is what I was told. It's like I don't know potatoes. What kind of strange, you know, uh, provision is that going to be? You know, so until I was taken to the store and they pointed out the potatoes to me, and I said, "Oh, you meant Irish potatoes?" And uh, there was my ex-wife at the time. She said, "No, I don't potatoes." And I said, "No, where I'm from, we call those Irish potatoes." Learning that it's not indigenous to Ireland is really interesting because that kind of shows the influence that the Irish had some of the influence that the Irish had on the islands at the time that we had to call it Irish potatoes and we didn't know it as anything else but Irish potatoes that was just a, a little interesting tidbit there popular at first but farmers and botanists eventually managed to breed a species that was hardier and more nutritious and tasted a lot better the Irish eventually embraced these modified potatoes and they became especially popular in impoverished communities. Over the centuries, Ireland became increasingly dependent on the pomme de terre, a fact that would put them on the brink of disaster by the 19th century. In 1844, across the world in Toluca Valley, Mexico, a new fungus emerged and began infecting potato crops still in the ground, rendering them inedible. This blight, which would come to be called Phytophora infestans, or pea infestans, quickly spread throughout the North American continent. Entire potato harvests were ruined. But Americans bred a wide variety of diverse crops, so they weren't impacted as badly as the Irish would be in 1845 when the blight arrived on their shores. Blights had happened in Ireland before. Those previous experiences caused scientists to initially misidentify the cause of the crop failure as an overly damp summer season, a not uncommon condition they called wet rot. When crops all across Europe began to similarly fail, it became apparent that something much more serious was going on. Scientists issued warnings, but just like in every disaster movie you've ever seen, those warnings were promptly ignored. When the crops first failed, those reports were also ignored. In fact, rather than take decisive action to alleviate the problem, then Prime Minister Robert Peel instead warned his cabinet that the Irish were prone to exaggerating. The British government would remain skeptical about the crisis even much later when people perishing by the hundreds of thousands. What's Rob that, that was an excuse for not knowing what was going on. Uh, there's a lot of that going around now. Blame something else for what's going on. Okay, so there's this blight going on. We don't know why. We can't explain it. We have no, 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 no true solution for why it's happening. And it's happening to apparently poor people 
So we're going to just say it's their fault. It's their fault that this is happening. So that way we won't have to directly deal with the problem or we won't have to do a speedy uh, uh, fix to the problem. Uh, like, and I could equate that to something that uh, that happened here a few years ago where uh, there was a, a whole lot of storms going through Florida and destroying uh, land and, you know, houses and businesses and stuff like that. Now, everybody's saying that the reason why that is happening so frequently is because of climate change. But since people didn't want to believe that the climate that there is climate change and of course a lot of capitalism played in there too you know because nobody wants uh, to, to change anything to fix climate change at least the people who are making money now with the way things are don't want to change anything they say oh you know what let's 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 spread this whole idea that it's the gay people that's causing it it's god's punishment to give for all the gay people in florida so they, they pinpoint a group and uh, what they call a marginalized group to blame for what's happening. Of course, nobody really believed that. So in essence, it's kind of the same thing, you know, hey, that's happening to them, not because there's something scientifically wrong or some kind of a, you know, disease is happening to pl plants and we need to speed up and fix it so people wouldn't die. They just went ahead and said, it's their fault. You know, the barbarians, they this, this is wrong with them. That's why this is happening, by just existing. They're creating the problem and they're using the same sort of uh, ideas today so that they don't have to fix certain things and uh, you know what i mean and while in the meanwhile houses are getting blown down people are losing money you know nobody's starving yet it's not got to that point down there yet but everybody's looking in another direction robert peel did decide to take some action he immediately ran into a problem fighting the famine would require importing large quantities of american grain However, imports were heavily restricted by a body of legislation known as Corn Laws. The Prime Minister attempted to repeal the law, but isolationist elements in the Whig Party blocked his efforts. In early 1846, as the first reports of casualties were being recorded, Peel created a public works program with the purpose of giving impoverished Irish citizens a chance to find employment so they could buy food. Unfortunately, the program would be short-lived. Peel lost the next election to a Whig Lord named John Russell. Lord Russell had very different ideas about how Ireland's problems should be dealt with. The newly elected Prime Minister entrusted the Irish relief efforts to a man who would go on to become one of the most despised and controversial figures in the history of Ireland, Charles Trevelyan. Trevelyan had served as the Assistant Secretary to the Treasury for years under Peel. However, his personal views were much closer to those of Lord Russell. Both men subscribed to the then-fashionable economic theory of laissez-faire economics. That is, they believed the free market would sort the problem out so long as the government didn't interfere, which some might consider a surprising outlook for the person in charge of leading government relief efforts. Even worse, Trevelyan was straight-up intolerant of the Irish people. The judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. The real evil with which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the people. From here... That's exactly what I was saying earlier. You see what I mean? They're immoral. That's why this is happening to them. You know what I mean? They correlate the blight to the people's morality. <laughs> That's just crazy. Things only got worse for the Irish. As if things weren't bleak enough already, the crop of 1846 failed just as the previous one had. With no increased response from the British government, the situation became desperate. A land agent traveling Ireland at the time wrote, The leaves of the potatoes on many fields I passed were quite withered, and a strange stench, such as I had never smelt before, but which became a well-known feature, for years after, filled the atmosphere adjoining each field of potatoes. The crop of all crops, on which they depended for food, had suddenly melted away. The few meager relief programs were overwhelmed by millions of applicants. Evictions soared, and a cold winter was on the way. that did try and bring some measure of relief to Ireland was the Society of Friends. 
also known as the Quakers. The Quakers acted much as today's Salvation Army does, soliciting donations from the wealthy and collecting clothing for the poor. After about a year, when it became apparent how long the famine would last, the Quakers found their donations were drying up. They considered their operation a failure at the time, but history would vindicate their efforts as thousands of people survived thanks to their program. Nonetheless, by this point, government neglect had left the problem too big for a charity to deal with. So you're probably asking yourself, if growing different crops mitigated the effects of the potato blight in the Americas, why didn't the Irish just grow different crops? In fact, Ireland was successfully producing all sorts of other grain crops, along with meat and dairy. So how could the people be starving? The landowners sold those other crops to people in Britain. Almost none were ultimately consumed in Ireland. Wow. The politicians said of the situation, the circumstances which appeared most aggravating was that the people were starving in the midst of plenty, and that every tide carried from the Irish ports corn sufficient for the maintenance of thousands of the Irish people. No, no, check this out. The question I have is, was the the rich people and the government treating the british people or the, the the english people the same way you know were english people struggling to make ends meet maybe not as bad as the irish was but was it still happening you understand what i'm saying and this is where we have to start communicating with each other so we know that we both are on the sort of similar situations and uh, it's a movement of the people that have to change that instead of listening to the leaders who tell you oh those people they are the blight they, they're immoral that's why they're suffering in the meantime you're suffering too and i could see that happening today and i try to explain to people at work listen you're saying it's those people it's those people it's those people but you know, we're all in the same boat here you know what i mean so how, how could it be the other person's fault when they're in the same boat as you are, struggling to make ends meet, paycheck to paycheck, and maybe they get government aid? Most people who work here, as where I work, most people who work, they're on government aid too. So instead of blaming them, and, and, and why are you blaming them? They're just trying to survive. And it's so hard to explain to somebody who think that, well, they're taking money away from me when they're, they're struggling just as much as you are. So uh, maybe a little solidarity might go a long way to curbing the situation and we could pay attention to where the real issue is coming from that's creating that situation. You know what I mean? High food prices, high rent prices. You know, other people are getting rich while both groups of people who sit there blaming each other are suffering and that's why i brought up the whole what was happening with the english uh, poor population then were they under like really stress stressful and strained times or living from as we say today paycheck to paycheck i don't know how they would say it back there or hand to mouth like we see on the island you know and that would be an interesting look to see during that period what was happening to the ordinary people uh in england at the time by 1847, the situation in Ireland had become a nightmare. After visiting the rural western town of Skibbereen and neighboring Bridgetown, London news journalist James Mahoney wrote, Not a single house out of 500 could boast of being free from hunger and fever, though several could be pointed out with the lifeless lying close to the living for the space of three or four, even six days, without any effort being made to remove the bodies to a last resting place. In wow. In another town he witnessed, a woman carrying in her arms the lifeless body of a fine child and making the most distressing appeal to the passengers for aid to enable her to purchase a coffin and bury her dear little baby. This horrible spectacle induced me to make some inquiry about her. When I learned from the people of the hotel that each day brings dozens of such applicants into the town. Peel's public works program didn't fare well under the administration of Charles Trevelyan. Workers would put in long days for insufficient pay. Then in March of 1847, Trevelyan ended the program entirely. He opted instead for a system of soup kitchens that would simply distribute food for free. Unfortunately, the British government refused to meaningfully back the program, and the kitchens quickly found themselves overwhelmed. 
Reports indicate that in some cases, a single kitchen would be responsible for the impossible task of feeding 10,000 people. Wow. Exacerbating the problem was the fact that the soup itself was a watery paste made from cornmeal and rice, and it was served in portions too small for even a child. Needless to say, the hunger grew worse, and the year 1847 got so bad, it would become forever known as Black 47. Things were bad, and many could not even pay their own rent. Landlords who knew they could use their valuable real estate to raise livestock or profitable crops were eager to evict tenants. More chillingly, some landlords were so eager to get rid of their tenants, they would offer to pay for their passage to America. The impoverished tenants would then be placed on ships that were overcrowded and rife with ailments like dysentery, typhus, and all manner of infectious disease. These vessels quickly earned the name Coffin Ships. When the coffin... Wow! All in the name of profit. I could make more money if I could totally uh, disregard humanity. That's crazy. I mean, I know it happens, but you know, when you th when you when you actually hear the history of it, it makes you go, "What the?" You know what I mean? When ships reach their destinations, they would drop off the sick passengers to perish on the streets of the New World. The landlords never had to worry about recriminations or consequences of any kind, since their victims were unable to return to Ireland and seek restitution. For the most desperate people, there was always the option to check into a public workhouse. Though they had existed in Ireland since the 1830s, the workhouses were ill-equipped to deal with the numbers of impoverished people created by the famine. Most were overcrowded, cruel, prison-like places that separated families, imposed draconian rules, and spread disease among its population. It is said that the workhouses were so bad, many people literally preferred going to prison instead. Inspired by uprisings in Paris, Irish nationalist sentiment began to take root. While the famine dragged on, an independence movement that called itself the Young Islanders spread throughout the country. Led by a politician named William Smith O'Brien, the Young Islanders built their followers from the starving masses and preached rebellion. In July of 1848, the group exchanged fire with the police and were quickly dispersed. While they didn't really make much of a difference at the time, the movement created crucial links between figures who would go on to play important roles in the fight for Irish independence later in the century. The Great Hunger lasted years, and the British government never changed its policies. So what finally ended it? Well, the Irish did improve their crop yields over time, and their economy did slowly adapt. But the real answer is far grimmer. The game changer was the significantly decreased population. So many had died or emigrated by 1852 that the food supply became adequate again. To underscore this point, in 1841, the population of Ireland was about 8 million people. Ten years later, that number sank to 6.5 million. By the end of the century, 1.5 million perished, 2 million had fled, and the population of Ireland had dwindled to a mere 4.5 million people. Wow. In the year 1853, 43% of all immigrants to the United States were Irish. With significant religious differences between the mostly Catholic Irish and the mostly Protestant Americans, the new arrivals were faced with legal oppression, economic hostility, and widespread anti-Irish sentiment. Famously, job ads at the time often included the warning, no Irish need apply. It would take decades for the Irish to overcome this initial resistance, but in time they integrated themselves into all aspects of American life. Today, Irish people are accepted as important parts of American culture. In 1999, Prime Minister Tony Blair acknowledged Great Britain's role in the Great Famine and apologized to the Irish people, writing, The famine was a defining event in the history of Ireland and Britain. It has left deep scars. That one million people should have perished in what was then part of the richest and most powerful nation in the world is something that still causes pain as we reflect on it today. Those who governed in London at the time failed their people. So what do you think about the plight of the Irish? Let us know in the comments. Wow. They just didn't do anything. And like I said, you can't really blame the whole country for that, man. It's the, it, 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 you know, it seems like uh, when there's uh, people in power or people who have more than others, they are, they are able to successfully make it seem like everybody is backing them. So like I've said before in other videos, when uh, 
people who are living under a certain ruler, while that ruler is oppressing another group of people, they too aren't living the best lives, a lot of them, you know what I mean? Because if, they, if, they, if they're greedy about uh, doing that to those people, then they're probably greedy about doing that to uh, their own people who they do not view as desirable, as morally uh, equal to them. Because, you know, when, it's, when it comes to money, people think the more money you have, the better person you are. And that still holds true today. People would rather listen to a rich person uh, making some common sense statement. And that person could be completely wrong, but because they have money, they don't listen to them. And I think that's what brings the backlash to where whenever a rich person falls, it's like big story, big drama, because people like seeing them fall because of their... their, their they're snubbing their nose at poor people and stuff. And I'm not saying all rich people do that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that happens a lot. But anyway, man, I hope you guys uh, learned something from this video that uh, as, as much as I have. And uh, if you have and you like what I react to, please uh, hit the like button. And uh, keep watching. I'm going to leave uh, uh, videos here on the other historical Irish uh, events, you know. So... You know, keep watching to learn as much as you can because the knowing more about each other, the better we understand each other. And possibly, the better we're going to get along. You all take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.